As COVID-19 cases continue exponential growth in the Western Hemisphere, healthcare workers who were on the front lines when the disease first arrived in the U.S. have a message for their colleagues who maybe aren't inundated quite yet. If you right now are in the luxurious situation that you don't have any of these patients and your community has been relatively spared, it's still critical right now to be getting started on your training. That is Dr. Angela Rogers, clinician and assistant professor of medicine specializing in pulmonary and critical care at Stanford University in Northern California. As Dr. Rogers mentioned, PPE can save the lives of healthcare workers and perhaps their families, but it's important to do it right. Really train your staff about how to use PPE because I would say for the first few days before I did my in-person trainings, I was not being thorough enough with my hand washing. I was not doing it with a full 20 seconds and doing the thumbs, doing the fingernails, you know, really more like scrubbing into the OR is what we're being taught for our PPE. So, you know, and the first few times I took off my mask and my N95, it kind of flipped and hit me in the nose, you know, and it's like, well, that probably did me more harm than good. Or I didn't take a really deep breath and make sure I had no fogging on my glasses, you know, get that stuff right so that your staff knows how to protect themselves. While healthcare workers continue to run into their respective burning buildings worldwide, those closest to them are playing a role too. I think they feel proud that I can do something to help patients and to a certain extent that by giving up their mom that they're doing their part too. There is a sense of pride in them. This is Medicine and the Machine an information and conversational podcast about how technology is impacting medicine now and how it will in the future. Hosted by Dr. Abraham Verghese and Dr. Eric Topol. I'm a producer on the show, Nick Andrews. Normally on Medicine in the Machine, we bring you conversations that feature topics like artificial intelligence and EHRs. But as the groundswell of COVID-19 and the novel coronavirus explodes, we, like so many out there, are using our platform to provide information about the pandemic, specifically to the healthcare men and women in the trenches. In this episode, one of the hosts of the show, Dr. Abraham Verghese, welcomes Dr. Angela Rogers to discuss COVID-19 in Northern California. Dr. Rogers discusses things like how it's going in the ICU with advice on what you can do to be prepared. Remember, there's a transcript of this conversation available wherever notes are found in your podcast app. You can also find more biographical information for either Dr. Rogers or Dr. Verghese in the notes section as well. Without any further delay, Please welcome one of the hosts of Medicine in the Machine, Dr. Abraham Verghese. I am just delighted to be chatting with uh, one of my wonderful colleagues, someone that has a great reputation amongst our residents and the faculty. And just as an illustration of how how pressing this new uh, issue is that we're all dealing with, uh, Angela has come straight from the ICU, and she was telling me in passing that she was in the process of transferring a patient to ECMO. And that's the word that I suspect that many lay people would not have even known of before. And now I think it's been in the press and people are more than aware of it. So thank you again for joining us in such trying circumstances. And I want to begin by simply asking, how are you doing? How are you coping with all this? Uh, th- well, thank you, Abraham, uh, for inviting me. It's uh, wonderful to get to talk to you. Um, as you know, um, we work together training um, uh, young doctors uh, in the um, practice of medicine. Um, and I would say, um, you know, in the intensive care unit, um, there's, I think a lay person would have the impression that it's a lot of machines that, you know, are t- sort of taking over the work of keeping people alive, which is absolutely true. Uh, we're very lucky to have great technology that um, helps people when they're incredibly sick uh, to give them a chance to get better. Um, but there is a very human side to the intensive care unit as well, uh, which is usually a lot of talking and reassuring patients and their families Um, and uh, working very, very closely with uh, the nursing staff and trainees to do everything we can for really the sickest patients in the hospital. Um, And it's true that um, the the, um, COVID pandemic that we're having um, has really heightened uh, the um, situation for everyone, patients and caregivers alike. Uh, So I guess the short, short answer to your question is, I am doing okay. You know, I um, think there is, uh, it's such an honor to be a doctor. 
I feel that way all the time that it's like it's wonderful to get to be uh, involved in people's lives at their darkest moments for patients and their families. To, it's such a privilege to get to care for them. And I uh, feel that way um, very much now as well. It's, you know, I think many things are worse now already, even though in California we've been relatively spared. Um, and so I would still say I'm very much filled with gratitude to be at work. Um, and there, you know, but but it is also more exhausting than usual. And there is a little bit of fear uh, from the team about, you know, what's coming next. I would say as an ICU doctor talking to people that practice in New York, where it's obviously overwhelming, um, they've had crushing numbers of patients coming in and really starting to feel like you can't give your best care to everyone. We're very lucky that we're not there. Um, and so I can only imagine what they're going through, but even um, what's happening here has been hard. Well, wow, thank you for that. You know, um, your audience for this, uh, the physicians on Netscape, many of them very much like me, the ICU is a distant memory. We don't really have much occasion to wander in there anymore. But, and we've been talking with, um, you know, with, for example, the dean of the Stanford Medical School, getting a sense of the institutional response and the stages in there getting ready and the lessons learned along the way. Tell us a little bit about, A, why this disease should bring such focus on the ICU, and also what exactly you've had to sort of learn and, and do in order to you know, scale up or be ready for what might come next. Right. Um, well, I think uh, what we're seeing is that um, as a, although most people who get COVID-19 have fairly minor symptoms and do fairly well, that there is a substantial portion of patients, you know, even if it's 1% or 2% of people who die, it's about 10% perhaps that get quite uh, sick, especially in the older age groups, that they then need intensive care. And so usually uh, we have plenty of capacity in the ICU. I, you know, at Stanford, I don't remember a time when it was like, the ICU is closed or nearly closed, you know, we, we can usually feel very confident that we can care for more people. But the fear is that the, this virus is causing people to have prolonged, not only that a number of people have respiratory failure, but that they really have it for a long time. Um, some reports are suggesting up to 20 days on average in people who survive their ICU stay. And so you can imagine if people are needing that much of a, a ventilator for that month, that long, if it's any substantial portion of the population, you could imagine very, very quickly running out of ICU space. Um, so that's, I think, why there's a great fear. Um, I will say that, you know, it, um, I also have been uh, in practice now for 15, 15 years or so, and I can certainly say that early on, you know, when I was a resident or medical student, you know, patients were very sedated in the ICU. The families were not there very often. It was really a, I would say, um, you know, a, a colder place than it, it is now. I think uh, ICU has evolved in a wonderful way to really be open. Families are welcome anytime. You know, we built this new hospital here at Stanford and, you know, every room has a uh, a seat that transforms into a couch. And so when I was here in January, you would see families that were all here, you know, supporting their loved one and were really involved. Patients were able to be quite awake. You know, it was it was great. And now with uh, the restriction on visitors, what you find is that the patients are alone uh, and, you know, the families are, you know, we can call them every day and update them, but it's so, so different uh, than practice, you know, than what we've become used to in the intensive care unit. And, and Angela, you happen to be an expert on ARDS, uh, the adult respiratory distress syndrome. Yeah. What, uh, uh, and that seems to be the major reason that these patients are getting intubated, if I understand. Tell us a little bit yeah. more about that. What's special about this virus and its tropism for the lungs, as far as we know? Yeah, I mean, apparently it, it uses the angiotensin uh, receptor uh, to um, gain entry into the um, lung cells themselves. Um, but why the lungs ha go in this course that they do is, as I would say, pretty unclear. Um, certainly, 
often patients, even with ARDS, can bounce back fairly quickly um, as long as you protect, care, you know, you carefully ventilate with lo- small tidal volumes, low pressure. The, uh, you know, a lot of people will get better from their ARDS. And in fact, many of the people who die of ARDS, their lungs have healed, but their problem is the rest of their body. You know, their kidneys have failed or they had bad cancer and other infection that led to the ARDS. Here, we, it seems like are seeing the opposite, that it's really about the lungs, at least in the early phase. Um, so later, there are issues with uh, heart failure that we um, seem to be seeing as well. Um, but it, early on, the, it's really the lungs out of proportion to the other things. Uh, and there, there are certain aspects that seem very different. The lung compliance is, it seems to be quite good uh, relative to the degree of hypoxemia. Um, so there are ways that this syndrome of ARDS seems to be different than others. Um, and I, I will say that, you know, usually in our clinical practice, you feel confident about a lot of the therapies that you're considering. You know, you're, you know to do lung protective ventilation, or you know to paralyze if they're really out of sync, or you know to use chlorhexidine or get, wake up your patient every day. There, you know, there are things that we know that we should do in every ICU patient, but here with COVID-19, there are just a lot of things that, you know, we're, see, we're all in the sort of learning together and texting our friends at other institutions. Have you see, had problems with mucus plugging? Do you, what, are, what are you guys doing with IL-6 levels? Are you checking ferritins? You know, you're kind of learning on the fly. Um, yeah. And in the meantime, the families are all Look, looking at the news, even the patients themselves will be sitting there in ICU on pretty high amounts of oxygen, and they're watching the news of COVID-19 and wondering what's coming for them. And it's, you know, terribly scary for them. Um, wow. So, you know, but then, and then they'll say, well, why aren't you giving me hydro- hydroxychloroquine? I was on the remdesivir trial. Now it's over. Which are you starting for me now? And, you know, they don't, it's hard to explain explain that, you know, the data for a lot of these therapies is so preliminary. Um, and our tendency in medicine is, as you know, to try to do something rather than to wait. But there is a real risk of just throwing on therapies based on in vitro studies that doesn't usually pan out well in medicine. Um, so trying to do the right trials is so, so important. Uh, and on the flip side, people don't really want to be in a placebo-controlled trial if they're hearing on the news that something might work great. Angela, uh, I suspect that uh, even though you've been in practice for 15 years, you probably missed the early days of HIV, which is a blessing for you. Yeah, but it's true. I have heard other... That... Oh, sorry. I apologize. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I was just going to say, how do you... How do you think that you and your colleagues and our residents are dealing with? And, you know, I must say that in many ways, this is much scarier than HIV for the physician, because I think very early on, we became aware, even before we had a name for the virus that caused HIV or caused AIDS, we knew, or we had reason to suspect that it was probably spread by blood and body fluids. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so we didn't feel quite as personally at risk in a very short time. So there's that big difference. But how do you think you and others are coping with, uh, I mean, how do you personally yeah, yeah. feel as you walk into the room recognizing right. that you are at risk? Right. Um, I will say that I have heard that from others that are, that um, you're right, that I um, became a med student in 1997. So I, you know, it, it was established how you would get um, HIV. But I have heard from others that those early days, especially, you know, in San Francisco or New York City, where it was really blossoming early and you couldn't understand what was happening with your patients, that it was a similar degree of fear. And, you know, in those days, the physicians would go around, you know, the residents, the trainees would draw the blood. And so, you know, it, it probably felt very frightening. Um, I would say that one thing about um, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is this feeling that it mostly is dangerous for older people um, is is reassuring, you know, for younger trainees. But I will say, you know, that um, we have a patient on our um, service who's in his 30s. And I will say that rounding on him, you could see the faces of your trainees were like, oh, my goodness, this person, you know, He's like us, you know. It's not. It's not like there's a guarantee for us that if we get this um, this illness, that we won't get very, very, very sick too. Um, so um, it is frightening. I do feel very um, 
um, like my institution has my back and is really doing their best to help protect us with um, training and um, how to put on equipment safely. Um, there's always this tension between should we do the full bunny suit like they did in China versus are we really okay with, you know, with the masks that we're wearing with the N95s? Is that enough? You hear about different changes uh, in what level of protection we need and wonder, are we saying we need less protection because we're running out or are we saying it's really, it's really safe? You know, there's a lot of uncertainty. So that's, I'm not saying that specific to Stanford again. I, you know, we are, I think again, relatively very lucky um, about the, the resources that we have and the training that we've had, but it is a frightening time. And I see that all across the country, that that's people's big fear. You know, are we doing enough to protect our healthcare workers? And certainly the feeling, you know, when you hear about primary care doctors that can barely have one surgical mask for the day, it seems crazy that that would be an acceptable level of protection. Um, so I would say, um, you know, uh, in terms of how do I feel, I would say most of the time I feel actually very secure. We have a good plan for getting in and out of the rooms and taking care of patients. Um, you know, I have two young kids at home. And so when I get home, I change right away and hop into the shower and wipe down my phone more than I've ever done before. Um, some people are wanting when they go on the COVID uh, surge teams to actually stay in a hotel for the whole time that they're um, there just to stay away from their families. Because um, obviously, as physicians and nurses, I think, and respiratory therapists, all of us, you know, have taken an oath that we're going to care for patients and this is our job, um, but obviously our families didn't. And so I think I would say, if anything, that's probably the fear that people have more. And may I ask, how, how is your family coping with, you know, this very real sense of, uh, you know, mom being at some risk? I think that my kids are very reassured that I'm young enough, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> so I, I don't dwell on the fact that there are young people here, too, that are getting sick. Um, I think they have seen that data and feel like I'm okay. What they see is that, you know, I'm working all the time and, and staying late, but I think they, you know, feel proud that we can, that I can do something to help patients and to a certain extent that by giving up their mom, that they're doing their part too. Um, I think there is a sense of pride in them uh, about what's happening right now. Stay with us. We'll be right back with Medicine and the Machine. You can read the transcript from this podcast and find more Medicine and the Machine episodes at medscape.com backslash machine. Medscape News features clinical tools and education are available for free. Stay on the pulse of medicine. Visit medscape.com. To circle back to uh, personal protection, I know that even though it's commonplace for us to have to don garb for various kinds of precautions, uh, to have to do this on almost everyone you see, especially everyone without a diagnosis, is challenging. And I know that you've taken the lead at Stanford uh, with the residents in sort of coaching how to properly don personal protection equipment. And I imagine there was a learning curve for you yeah. about that. Would you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I, I think we all feel like, you know, we wear yellow gowns all the time for MRSA, for flu, right? That's another respiratory virus. You just slap on your yellow gown and do a quick hand wash and go in. And, you know, I, I have not heard of a fellow physician getting the flu, you know, from any of that. And it didn't feel perilous to do that. Um, as I mentioned now, you know, with the uh, coronavirus, a, a big question is like, what is enough protection? Um, and certainly I would say that doing a very thorough education plan around correct donning and doffing is so important. I feel so much better now having not only watched the CDC videos, which changed my practice, but then going through a one-on-one 40-minute -on -one, uh, session where I watched someone doff and we went through all the steps and then she watched me doff and said, nope, you contaminated yourself there. No, you did it again. Um, you know, you, it's not until you start going into the rooms that you realize, you know, how am I going to use a stethoscope on this patient? Because I'm sticking, uh, you know, the terribly bad quality stethoscope that's in the room, but it's, you know, it's into my naked ear. 
And so is it, is that clean enough? You know, so I wipe everything down. Uh, but, I, you know, as an internist, the idea that I wouldn't listen to my patients on the ventilator just seems crazy, you know. So I think um, those kind of things are so important. As you know, as internists, you know, our the, our uh, <laughs> procedure really is a physical exam and a history. And so the degree to which it's difficult to be in common communication with your patient and to just pop in and see, oh, is their belly softer now? And okay, their pips are higher. Are they wheezing? It's, you know, it really is a, um, a decision to go into every room in part because it's going to take a long time. And secondly, because you're wasting PPE that could, not wasting, but you're spending PPE that might be needed a week from now if things start to get worse. You know, the interesting thing about this epidemic, um, I mean, there's nothing about it that's, you know, not interesting, even as it's, you know, just horrifying. But the interesting thing is that the ventilator has become almost the focal point for all kinds of discussion. And it harks back almost to the polio era when, you know, they had big halls full of people on iron lungs with uh, the external breathing devices. Yeah. What um, what are your thoughts on ventilators and the capacity to, you know, have enough ventilators using them for two patients? Uh, are there alternatives to that? At, at one level, it's a fairly simple machine that blows air into the lungs. Yeah. Uh, but obviously, you can do much more with that. Right. I mean, there has... Um... There is a widely circulating YouTube video that I've had to email my way many times of, you know, of someone explaining how you could potentially tie multiple ventilators together to use one machine for multiple people. And I believe that that was used in Las Vegas at the time of the mass shooting, um, you know, to because you couldn't get more ventilators very quickly. And so how do we do this? Uh, the problem is that with ARDS, the, the lung stiffening syndrome that people have in coronavirus, people's lungs are really different. As, you know, so early on when you're sick, you know, someone may have stiff lungs, the other person has not as stiff lungs, and then you know, one person coughs out a mucus plug and the other person doesn't. And so you can imagine that in Las Vegas, when you have a bunch of traumas but relatively healthy lungs, that that would be a lot safer than especially early on in the phase of ARDS. So you know, I, I, um, I know that in uh, New York, they're already facing this idea of, do we need to start using two ventilators for one person? Um, and Maybe there would be a role for that, you know, later in the syndrome, for example, as people are starting to recover, but they're still sleepy from their sedation. So their lungs are better, but it's other problems. You know, maybe at that point, you could imagine that that would be a way to stretch things. But, you know, and, and obviously, in desperate times, you would try anything to, you know, our job is to save as many people as possible. Um, but obviously, it's a kind of a worst case scenario to have to get there, I guess. We all really, really hope that the social distancing that everyone is doing, um, it really seems like people are starting to take this seriously as, as you look around the country and see what's happening. Uh, we really obviously hope very much that we don't get there. Yeah, I must say that some of our projections were that we would have a surge this week and we still may well, but um, I think we're hoping that because we were a little earlier than most, this county especially, but also than the state that perhaps we've warded that off. I wonder yeah. if you would uh, reflect on a hospital without some of the great advantages that we have, say a hospital with, uh, you know, with no intensivist, but with an ICU and two or three ventilators. Um, you know, if you had to advise a place like that, that has so far not faced the onslaught, but will shortly, I mean, how do you even begin to prepare for something like that? Yeah. In a small community hospital with I will say that issues. I will say that as you mentioned Abraham so far um we have had sort of a slow increase I would say we're expecting that we'll um have a second um it will open a third ICU team um, probably on Monday um, as things are, are getting busier um so we have had relative um a relatively slow amount of time I would say for the first, last past 2 weeks I have spent at least four hours a day, even, you know, working on getting protocols in order, working on the donning and doffing training, um, you know, 
figuring things out about, you know, okay, now we have a person who it's going to take 15 minutes potentially to get everyone in the room if there's an emergency. So given that, do we use slightly deeper sedation? Do we change certain practices? Those kind of things. So I would say that if you're, you, if you right now are in the luxurious situation that you don't have any of these patients and your community has been relatively spared, it's still critical right now to be getting started on your training. Really train your staff about how to use PPE. Because I would say for the first few days before I did my in-person trainings, I was not being thorough enough with my hand washing. Again, I've been hand washing for 15 years. I was not doing it with, you know, a full 20 seconds and doing the thumbs, doing the fingernails, you know, really more like scrubbing into the OR is what we're being taught for our PPE. So, you know, and the first few times I took off my mask and my N95, it kind of flipped and hit me in the nose, you know, and it's like, well, that probably did me more harm than good. Or I didn't take a really deep breath and make sure I had no fogging on my glasses. You know, you, we really get that stuff right so that your staff knows how to protect themselves. And it's not just the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the doctors. It's the the x-ray techs that are going into the rooms. It's the um, housekeeping people who are coming in and taking out the trash. Everyone deserves an extremely thorough training, and, you know, and that's just the PPE part of things. But the second part is, okay, you know, what, what now I would say there's an increasing body of literature from the places that are ahead of you um, that have protocols for what they're doing for proning. You know, how is it different? You know, we're taping, doing taping stuff for the, you know, to get patients ready to prone so that nothing pops off when, you know, when the patient is turned, you know, get those, pro start reviewing those protocols from other institutions that are being made widely available and get those adapted for your community setting so that when it happens, which it almost certainly will, that you'll be ready and can give the best care for your patients. Angela, this has been a, a wonderful insight, uh, which I think our listeners will greatly appreciate into you know, the world of uh, the ICU and also someone very thoughtful experiencing, because I think the human experience of this, uh, especially on the patient side, but to no small degree on the physician side is so important. If you would share with us as we as we close, what are what are two memories you have of things that are just powerful uh, that that you will take with you the rest of your life out of this experience so far? Um, I guess one of the things I would say is I am moved by the extent to which my colleagues are all stepping up uh, to help these patients. I mean, I constantly see nurses rushing in to help the physician team. You know, we have, a, a, again, at Stanford, we're relatively lucky that we have a lot of people who aren't in ICU all the time um, and do a lot of, you know, like I do some research. So we have a number of physicians who are willing to step up and start staffing more ICUs. So we have a plan to, you know, staff up to 100 extra ICU beds uh, from our normal, from all these doctors that are just willing to step in and do it. And obviously it will take a lot of nurses. It's a team effort for sure. But I would say, and, you know, from the residents, you know, I, I think, you know, there, there's no question in their minds about that the answer is how can I help the fellows too? What can I do? You know, you know, X, Y, and Z are canceled. I don't want to just at home, I am a critical care physician, what can I do to help get us through this period? So I would say the first thing is that um, people should know that, you know, we have an amazing profession. Um, it sounds like this audience is doctors. I'm proud to be one of you. I think we are um, doing an amazing job um, in, this, in this time. Um, I guess the second thing I would say uh, is uh, in terms of just the, the patient experience, um, you know, I think there are so many moments um, with patients that have COVID-19 that are very moving. I, um, I had a patient on my service this week who um, was quite young and, and quite ill with a lot of chronic medical problems and had come in with pneumonia and his um, and, you know, was waking up um, w uh, from the ventilator. Um, and he was wanting to write and, you know, he still had his breathing tube in, so couldn't write. So, you know, untied him and he's writing and you can't really tell what he's saying. Is he saying community? And what he was writing was coronavirus, uh, wondering if he had coronavirus. And, you know, we said, no, you know, your coronavirus test was negative. And he just started to cry. He was sobbing. He was so happy. You know, even a patient critically ill in the ICU who 
has pneumonia and is on a vent, you know, his, his big concern was, is what I have coronavirus. So I think things like that, you know, really being there with the patients, having, you know, the families cannot be with them. So it really is again on us and the nurses to, you know, be, be that, um, you know, be the support system for our patients who are tremendously frightened of what's happening. Um, so I would say that um, the response, you know, getting to be a physician in these times for our patients is such an honor, uh, as is being a physician with our colleagues. Well, I, I would say that uh, any patient who has you would be enormously <laughs> lucky. Your humanity comes through, uh, you know, even in this mechanism of a podcast. Angela, I wanted to ask you if you, in the course of this, have you had moments where you've had to steal yourself? I wouldn't say a negative experience, but certainly something that you've had to overcome. Uh, we've talked about moments of great inspiration and joy, but have there been moments of the opposite nature? Um, I would say that for me, the the worst part is um, has been the fear among fellow staff, you know, and physicians about whether the personal protective equipment um, is enough, whether our country is sort of sending us, I, in one, um, in, in one online thread I read, someone said, you know, it feels like we're being sent into a war with pool noodles, <laughs> you know, that like you look at the pictures in China and they have full protective gear and they're in completely isolated wards and, you know, like they go for four hours and then they come out and, you know, it's like, it's, much, much more intense. Is, is it like, is it really okay for us in the outpatient setting to have, be wearing a surgical mask? Is an N95 enough? If, is, my, is it okay that my hair gets touched by a stethoscope? You know, that part of things of, you know, is it enough? Is the country, does the country have our back? Um, but, you know, as a healthcare team that, you know, is, you know, why isn't the army coming in and making more ventilators if that's what you know, is needed in, you know, in New York and, you know, every people are truly running out of PPE. Have we done everything we could to flood uh, our healthcare workforce um, with protection? I would say that that for me has been the hardest thing. And, you know, early on, I think watching people not uh, isolating, you know, like it was just like you see the drum beats and you, you are hearing from Italy that they're running out of ventilators and bagging patients. You know, you're getting these you know, boots on the ground um, reports from, you know, from, from the future, it feels like. And then you look online and you see that people are all still at the beach and you're just like, how can we help people listen? Um, and so I would say for a lot of us, and I'm sure that that's true of these, of your listeners who are physicians, I'd say that was the hardest part at the beginning was feeling like we could save lives if everyone would stay home, but they're not. Um, and and then later this feeling that the the workforce isn't adequately protected um, by doing everything we can to really 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 rapidly escalate the PPE if it's needed. You know your answers are so so. Other things that you'd like to share with us? Any other special moments that have inspired you or touched you? Uh, please don't wait for me to lead you into a question because I sense that you're just bursting with um, the reactions to this unique time in our in our lives. I guess for me overall, I um, I feel like this is an amazing time to be a physician uh, and um, in the intensive care unit, uh, if people are being called to join the intensive care unit team, which I think a lot of people in New York already are, you know, you didn't do a full um, fellowship in intensive care, but it, I always tell my trainees that 90 plus percent of ICU is medicine. So it's watching for heart failure, it's watching for kidney failure, you know, and, and you can learn the vents again. So anyone who has done an internship um, and um, or a medicine residency and has been in the ICU a few times, or if you're willing to come back uh, and help in the intensive care unit, um, it's a it's an amazing place uh, to get to care for patients uh, and um, working closely. You can, you can, you know, get, get it back up to speed on vents fairly quickly um, and really help um, hopefully save lives. So um, please consider if you're in a place where you, um, you know, you're in a specialty that's relatively underutilized right now because 
um, a lot of places are locked down, consider helping in the places that you're needed most. It sounds scary, but, you know, it's it's really medicine, 90 percent of it. Um, and then a touch of vents and pressors, which you can be taught um, and by someone who's there to, to guide you. And so more hands is definitely better uh, than less. I don't know if you know this, Angela, but I'm board certified in infectious disease, but also in pulmonary medicine, although it was more infectious disease that uh, that had my interest. Uh, so I guess uh, if I came to you, you would be able to show me the ropes again. It seems like I, a long time ago, but I, I would. <laughs> I, I would love nothing more, Abraham, than for you to be on my team. <laughs> All right. It would be an honor. Uh, listen, it's been just amazing to have you, and I know that we literally took you out of the ICU, you know, uh, after a very long day, I'm separating you from your family. We're the only thing standing in your way right now, so we're not going to stand in your way any longer. <laughs> and, uh, we're still it's this great. conversation in about 20 notes. <laughs> <laughs> Angela, thank, thank you guys you so for much. having me. Thank you. Thank you.